um, why don't you grab your Bibles and open up to the Gospel of Mark. We have been working our way through this book for the last couple of weeks, and this morning we'll be in that book once again, but let's turn to Mark chapter 11. As it is Palm Sunday, we're going to take some time this morning to focus on this special Day. Mark chapter 11 this morning is where we'll find ourselves in God's Word. I'll be reading and teaching from the New Living Translation just as an FYI. But, you know, you may wonder, Palm Sunday, why is this Sunday significant? Not, Not only is it worth mentioning, but in the 21st century... Setting aside a Sunday to to remember, to to celebrate. What's up with Palm Sunday? You know, nowadays, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it seems that almost every single day is the national or international day of something, right? And my kids love that we have an Alexa in our kitchen so they can ask Alexa, Alexa, what is today? And it seems like every other week, somehow it's National Donut Day, right? Like, Dad, it's, it's Donut Day. We have to do it. I don't know who decides those things, but um, there, there's a day, I guess, in the month of March where it's the National Dress in the Color Blue Day. Like, this is just grasping at straws. Um, today, April 2nd, is the National Peanut Butter and Jelly Day. So, yeah, some people are stoked about that. I don't know who decides these things. And, you know, some suggest, based on Scripture, Psalm 14, 1, that only the fool says in their heart that there is no God, that yesterday was the international day of atheism, right? Do you get that? April Fool's, Psalm 14, maybe not. I don't know. But Palm Sunday, why do we celebrate Palm Sunday? Well, for believers, we know it to be the day of the triumphal entry of Jesus into what city? Does anybody know? Yeah, front row knows. That's good. (laughs) Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It marks exactly one week to the day of the day for us as believers. Resurrection Day. Easter. It's kind of the height of Jesus' journey to the cross. And let me have your attention. That's where his gaze was when he was on earth. Toward the cross. That was his ultimate purpose. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus says this, For the Son of Man, a title that he used more often than any other throughout the New Testament to describe to us who he is, both 100% man and 100% God, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are what, church? Lost. That's why he came. Now, how did Jesus accomplish this? Through his teachings, his healings, his life example? Those are all part of it for sure but through the cross and the resurrection. Without this weak church, Jesus going to the cross and rising from the grave, as the Apostle Paul would say in the book of 1 Corinthians, without the resurrection, all that we do here, this is just foolishness. Because Jesus, his primary purpose wasn't to come to teach a new way to live or just absolve us from temporary suffering, but to get at the root of all suffering so that one day Alzheimer's does not have the final word. But Jesus does. How does Jesus accomplish this task? To seek and to save the lost through the cross and resurrection. And Palm Sunday... It kind of marks what some have called Passion Week, meaning the the final seven days of this journey of Jesus in his earthly ministry. And the gospel accounts, how many gospels are there? Does anyone know? Four. Did you know that in the gospels, almost 50% of the gospel of John is dedicated to that one week? 40% of the gospel of Matthew is dedicated to that one week. 60% of the gospel of Mark is about those last seven days. One-third of the gospel of Luke is dedicated to this week. A significant amount of the account of who Jesus is is about this week. There's 89 chapters in total of all the gospel accounts. 
Four of them have to do with those kind of first 30 years of Jesus' life. 85 chapters have to do with those three and a half years of his ministry, and 29 are dedicated to this week that starts today. So for me, I'm all about peanut butter and jelly. I mean, I think that's great. But this day's a big deal. For the gospel writers to focus this much time and attention upon this final week of Jesus' life and ministry, you must know it's important if God repeats himself so clearly. In all four gospel accounts, we have an account of what's known as today as Palm Sunday. And for us this week, we'll have three days, at least three days, that are significant for this Resurrection Week, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And they go together, not just in sequence, but also as a full expression and declaration of who Jesus is, his life, his ministry, and his ultimate purpose. See, for me, this is how I remember the importance of these three days. Today, Palm Sunday is all about the message of Jesus. See, today, as we consider Palm Sunday, we'll see very clearly Jesus declaring a message of who he is. And then on Good Friday, we see the method by which he came to seek and save the lost. And then Easter Sunday, you know it starts with an M, right? Easter Sunday is the miracle. The miracle. Today is the message. Jesus is going to declare very publicly who he is. If you ever had any sense of fogginess, ambiguity of who is Jesus, who did he declare himself to be? Not those around him, but who did he declare himself to be? This morning, Palm Sunday, it's defined, it's exclaimed, it's declared publicly who Jesus is. Good Friday is the method by which he takes our place, where he dies our death so that we could live his life. And then Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, is the miracle that proves the message. See, we'll see that without a pulpit, without a program, but with a reception of the recognition of being Messiah, that on Palm Sunday, Jesus publicly, clearly, loudly, you could say, unashamedly, declares a message. And here's my hope as we spend some time in Mark chapter 11 this morning, that we would see with crystal clarity who Jesus is as the promised Messiah, the one who would go, and by that method of the cross, miraculously on Easter Sunday, rise again and conquer sin, death, and the grave. So are you in Mark chapter 11? Okay. Let me read to you verses 1 through 11, and then we'll consider this powerful and significant day known as Palm Sunday. Verse 1, again, reading from the New Living Translation. In fact, we'll put it up on the screen for you this morning. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. That's not not carte blanche for all believers. You can't use that kind of phrase anytime you need something (laughs) in life, I found. But verse 4. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? And they said what Jesus had told them to say. So they were permitted to take it. And they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their garments over it, their outer coats, and he sat on it. And many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. Others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields, and Jesus was in the center of the procession. And the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! 
blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the kingdom, the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple, and after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon, and then he returned to Bethany with his 12 disciples. Father, as we open your word this morning, would you do what you're always so faithful to do? Open our hearts. Speak by your Holy Spirit. Lord, for the sake of your word and the sake of your people, I ask that you'd speak, that you'd encourage, that you would instruct, that you'd convict. Lord, that you would illuminate who you are to our hearts and that we would choose to follow you in a deeper and more significant way today than when we first came. Lord, we love you and pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. As we open this text this morning, let me see if I can kind of explain what's going on. Palm Sunday begins with Jesus and his disciples traveling over the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead of his crew, his traveling group, into that village of Bethpage to find an animal to ride. Now, if you've read through the gospel accounts, little light bulbs should be going off in your head. This is unique. Jesus doesn't often do this. And he seems to be very uh, specific. Some would say like, like mystical. Like maybe if you grew up in the 80s watching, it's like Obi-Wan to Luke, like go into the town and you will find a donkey. Like it's very unique. Like you don't often see Jesus doing this with his disciples. And they find exactly what Jesus describes, a cult. Not been ridden, not even broken in yet. And as they untie it, just like Jesus said, the owners begin to question. And this wasn't like a new ministry for the disciples. They didn't just start like a donkey stealing disciples thing. That's not what's what's happening here. And the disciples respond to these owners. Hey, the Lord has need of it. Right. And like we shared, that's not like something that is now prescribed for believers. You know, often when you read through the scriptures, you have to determine, is this descriptive or prescriptive? Is the Lord telling me now when I need something just to go and use that phrase? Hey, the Lord needs it. That doesn't work at the car dealership or the grocery store or your kid's candy stash. Right. The Lord has need of it. So that's why. I'm No, that's that's not what's happening there. But there's something specific as someone who's reading through the gospel accounts. This should pique your interest. So they bring the donkey to Jesus, and the disciples take their outer coats and cloaks, their outer garments. They place it on the donkey, and Jesus sits on it. And as Jesus goes into Jerusalem, a large crowd, a large crowd begins to gather. Why? Why the crowd? Is it like a Super Bowl Sunday? Is that what's happening in Jerusalem? Kind of. You say, what do you mean by that? There were large numbers of people in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. See, it was during this time that Jews remembered their deliverance from Egypt by bringing a sacrificial lamb. I don't know if I can communicate this effectively, but this is a big day a big deal in the most important city for the Jews, Jerusalem. One ancient Jewish writer, Josephus, he was a historian, not a Christian, just a historian that was hired to account for history during this time, reported that in the mid-first century, at one Passover, there was tallied over 250,000 sacrificial lambs for this feast of Passover in Jerusalem. And often in this culture, one lamb would represent about 10 people for those whom were coming to celebrate and to sacrifice. So it's not too far off to recognize, to believe, to consider that there may have been upwards, upwards of over two and a half million people thronging into this city of Jerusalem. Two million of those may have been guests because many would assume based on historical accounts that Jerusalem at this time maybe had a couple hundred thousand residents. Two million visitors. Two million visitors in Jerusalem. We kind of know what that's like, right? A town overrun with guests. Pensacola Beach, 4th of July. Anyone ever been out there? Highway 98 even, just these days. That's what it is. 
Well, one author describes the emotion of this crowd. What would have been going on in the mind and the heart of the people? D.A. Carson says this, that the Passover feast was to the Jews what the 4th of July is to Americans. It was a rallying point for intense nationalistic zeal. And this goes some way of explaining their fervor by which they sought to by force make Jesus their king. Are you getting the tone of what's happening in Jerusalem? It's crowded. It's an important time of year. People are showing up from all over the place, bringing their sacrificial lambs in. And this large, zealous crowd gathers to see Jesus, who they've heard about for the last three and a half years. He touches lepers. People are ripping roofs off the ceiling during his sermons, and he's healing them, forgiving of sins. He's healing blindness. I heard he walked on water. I think many in the crowd believed that Jesus was their Messiah. They've heard these teachings. They've seen these miracles. And the actions of the crowd on that day gives gives us the name that we have for today, Palm Sunday. They, They begin to take off their coats and lay them on the ground in honor of Jesus riding into town. And they they cut these palm branches. All of this was a, a sign. It was a symbol. For someone to take off their coats and to lay it down on the ground for someone entering into the city, that was a sign of like subjects to a king. Your king, your royalty. We recognize who you are. And they're waving these palm branches. And look at verse 9, what they're saying. Not what they're saying, what they're shouting. Praise God. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest. It's like the fireworks are going off. The Jewish national anthem's being played. They're waving the branches. The coats are laid down. The disciples are there as Jesus' crew coming into Jerusalem. There is tremendous fervor and zeal and excitement and anticipation for what's about to happen. That's the tone. That's the setting. That's what the Bible tells us is happening on Palm Sunday. But what's the significance of it? How how does it connect with us from the first century to the 21st century? Let me see if we can, in the next 22 minutes that we have together, ask four simple questions. Here they are. Why? Why why does Jesus need this donkey? Like, why the Obi-Wan kind of experience, right? Right? What's what's going on with that? Why why does he send his disciples and and ride in a donkey? Why does Jesus need a donkey? What's up with the palms? I mean, the day is called Palm Sunday. Why are the palms significant? What are they shouting? Like, is this something they had to rehearse? Okay, when Jesus comes in, I want this side over here and that. What are they shouting? Why are they shouting this? Why does it matter? Why does Jesus need a donkey? Well, can you remember with me the way in which Jesus often traveled, as we see recorded for us in the gospel accounts. He didn't ride a horse, which really the Romans did and would have been kind of an expensive thing to do. He wasn't carried on like a couch by the apostles, right? Like, okay, it's time for the Sermon on the Mount. Here comes Jesus. No, he didn't travel in a chariot or a cart. He walked everywhere. But Palm Sunday... It's different. Palm Sunday is the only time in his life that we're given a record in the Gospels that he's got some kind of different mode of transportation. Why? Why is this significant? Well, 450 to 500 years before this day, Palm Sunday, there was a prophet, the prophet Zechariah, that prophesied an event that we now call Palm Sunday. It's found in Zechariah 9.9. I'll read it to you. It says this. The prophet says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Why a donkey? Well, to come riding in a donkey in general, as opposed to a war horse, was, was to mean that the person coming was a man of peace. 
that that's what he's coming to bring. Jesus didn't come to Jerusalem as a, as a conquering general, but to be the suffering servant. But here's the thing I want you to catch. Jesus is making a very bold statement. He's declaring a message. He's fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. 9. And by doing that, he's accomplishing two things. Number one, here's the message. I am the one whom you have been waiting for. This is the message. He's declaring himself to be that king, that Messiah. And he's deliberately challenging all those religious leaders around him. Why a donkey? Jesus is publicly and loudly declaring a message without even saying a word, without even a pulpit, that he is the one whom they have been expecting. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He, he's on a donkey, not a steed, not a war horse. He's a different kind of king. This is huge. Buddha, nor Muhammad, nor Confucius, none of these individuals claim to be king, but Jesus right here on Palm Sunday is saying, I am the Messiah. Jesus wasn't just looking for his disciples to steal donkeys to get him a ride. He's declaring his royalty as the promised king. This is the message. Now, what's up with the palms? Well, the palm was a symbol of national independence for the Jews at that time. See, 200 years before Palm Sunday, there had been a, a revolution of sorts against some Syrian oppressors led by a man named Judas Maccabeus. One author put it this way to describe what happens in that culture historically. He said, Judas Maccabeus miraculously led Israel into a victory over the Syrian occupation. And upon the victory, crowds celebrated by plucking palm branches off trees and waving them ecstatically. This is in the history of the Jews. An ocean of waving branches did more to capture the essence of that moment than anything else. Children and grandparents, soldiers and girlfriends, vine dressers and stonemasons rushed into Jerusalem waving the palm branches. The picture was unforgettable. Like that famous front page news article of when World War II ended and crowds are just thronging. The author goes on to say it was so memorable, the moment of freedom and national dignity that Judas, known as the hammer, stamped the image of the palm branches onto their coins, symbolizing victory for the Jews over an occupational force. The palm branch from that point forward was minted onto temple coinage as a reminder of what really happened. Victory, independence, a conqueror, a king. The palm branch is a sign of Israel's freedom. And waving it would have been like someone walking down the street with the stars and stripes, right? It's a patriotic statement. They're reminded of what happened just a couple hundred years earlier through one of their famous and well-known revolutionaries. In fact, you today can go to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, and there's several Jewish coins from the first and the second century stamped with palm branches, and this is the slogan on them, for the freedom of Jerusalem. The palm branch wasn't just like, man, it looks like Jesus is hot. Let, let's get some you know, first century AC going. We got, we got to take our coats off. It's hot out here. Let's just lay them down on the ground. No, they're laying coats down as a symbol of a subject, saying, we honor you. We, we recognize who you are. And here's what we're ready for you to do. You're going to deliver us. It's on our coins that we're here to celebrate with this Passover. The crowd is jazzed. They're decked out in, to the nines in the first century. They got their palm branches, right? That's like white after Memorial Day or whatever that means. They're, they're dressed appropriately for the season. Do you get what I'm saying? They're ready. They've heard about this Messiah. They're ready to welcome a conquering king. So why the donkey? Our first question. I hope you get this. Jesus is declaring a message. This is unique. He doesn't ride into Jerusalem or ride into anywhere, anywhere else in Scripture that we know of. Yet very specifically says, boys, I want you to go get that donkey. Anyone asks, you tell him I need it. And he rides into town. 
Why? Jesus is declaring a message about who he is. What's up with the palms? Well, they're ready to receive their king. It's a sign of freedom. Now, what are they shouting and why? Look at verses 9 and 10 again with me. It says that Jesus was in the center of the procession. All the people around him are shouting, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessing on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, praise God in the highest. Set yourself in the sandals of all that's going on here. They're patriotic. They're kind of fed up with the Roman oppression that's been upon them. And in their patriotism, in their zeal, they're shouting. Their branches go perfectly with what they're sensing and feeling. And what are they shouting? Well, this phrase, praise God, this dynamic blessings, the song we sang earlier, often we know it as the word Hosanna. Hosanna. Now, what does this word mean? It's found in one place in the Old Testament, Psalm 118, where it literally just means save, please. It's simply a cry for help. Like, like my little Leonidas, he's learning how to ride a bike. And so this weekend, as he's kind of cruising around the cul-de-sac, he kind of turns those front handles a little too sharp, a little too quick, and over he goes. And so immediately, what's he do? Hosanna. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> but he shouts out, Dad, help, right? Tears and bloody knees, and he just needs help. That's what he's shouting. And initially, Hosanna, that's all that word meant. Help, help, please. But the word grew in meaning from the time that the author of Psalm 119 first penned it. One author says this about how this word developed, and it's important to get the sense of what's happening in this moment and especially for our moment. One author put it this way. It used to mean save, please. But gradually, as words do, it came to mean something else. It came to mean salvation, salvation, salvation has come. I like what he says here. He says, it used to be what you would say when you were falling off the diving board, right? But it came to be what you would say when you see the lifeguard coming to save you. It's the bubbling over of a heart that sees hope and joy and salvation on the way and can't help but keep it in. So when they're saying Hosanna, some are saying, hooray, salvation. It's coming. It's here. Salvation, salvation. When they're saying Hosanna to the son of David, they're saying, listen, the son of David, he's our salvation. Hooray for the king. Salvation belongs to him. And when they say Hosanna in the highest, it's like they're saying this. Let all the angels in heaven rejoice. Salvation, salvation. Let the highest heaven sing the loudest song. You need to catch the tone of what many are saying on that Palm Sunday. They're excited. They're patriotic. They're waving their palm branches, signs and symbols of freedom. And they're shouting with this mindset. Some may be that mindset of just save us now. Get us out of this Roman oppression. Others, though, may be saying salvation is here. This is him. He, he's riding in. Remember WrestleMania of the 80s and 90s? Hulk Hogan? This is Messiah mania. That's what's sweeping the country, right? He's not ripping his shirt and got some kind of bad haircut, but this is what's happening. It's Messiah. People are excited. 200 years earlier, Judas Maccabeus had ridden in from Galilee to attempt to bring freedom. And now here comes Jesus. There's got to be this anticipation. Here he is, a miracle worker. Yeah, Judas Maccabeus, he was this great military leader, but Jesus, he can just multiply food. He can pull coins out of fish's mouth. He can heal people that have diseases. He challenges the religious leaders, and they're dumbfounded. He is here. He's going to save. Their heart was to have the Romans out, and they may have thought, Maybe Jesus has been toying with religious leaders through these parables and these riddles and these stories, but, but now he's riding in and look at him. He's, he's receiving worship. And the people were hoping for another Maccabean-like revolution. 
And what's crazy to me in all their fervor and all their passion and all their praise, what we see here in verses 9 and 10 is actually a quote from Psalm 118. A psalm that the religious leaders of the day would have known was a psalm that was written about the coming Messiah. Psalm 118 reads, Save us, we pray, O Lord. We pray, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And the Jewish leaders, those who had been opposed to Jesus all throughout his earthly ministry, in Luke 19, it says that some in the crowd said, teacher, you need to rebuke your disciples. Do you see what's going on here? They're waving the palm branches. This is a symbol of freedom, revolution. Their, their cloaks are down. You're riding in on a donkey, and now they're quoting a messianic psalm. Jesus, it's very clear what you're doing here. You're receiving worship as the king of the Jews. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. And what does Jesus say in Luke 19? Jesus saw no need to rebuke those who told the truth. He replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones are going to begin to cry out. Here's the deal. Why a donkey? Jesus is preaching a what church? It starts with an M and it rhymes with sesage. Do you know the word? He's preaching a message. He, he's riding in on a donkey. This is a prophecy from 450, 500 years ago. It's a symbol of peace. He's declaring himself to be Messiah. Why does Jesus need the donkey? Because he's declaring a message. What's up with the palms? It's a sign of freedom, a sign of a conqueror. What are they shouting? Hosanna. What, save. Save us now. Salvation is here. Why are they shouting it? Because they ultimately need salvation of a different kind. See, here's the thing as we began our time together this morning that I shared. There's three key days for us this week. Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter or Resurrection Sunday. And they go together not just in sequence, but as a full expression, a full declaration of Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus is not ambiguous in the Gospels about who he is. If you've been traveling with us through the book of Mark so far, hopefully you've already picked up on that, where he's saying things like the kingdom of God is here and now, where he's using titles like the Son of Man, well, here in Mark chapter 11 and in all those other places throughout the Gospels where they put such a focus on this week and on this day, Jesus is declaring a message ever so clearly. I am the one who has been promised to come. He does this without a pulpit, without a program, without graphics, without video, without a TikTok following, right? He's declaring a powerful message. I am the Messiah. Good Friday, as we gather together this Friday evening, we'll remember the method by which Jesus saves the world. And Easter Sunday, the miracle whereby Jesus proves who he claims to be. See, Palm Sunday means nothing without Resurrection Sunday. But Palm Sunday means everything with Resurrection Sunday. You see who he claims to be, and then he proves it. And you need to know this about miracles. Miracles are always attached to a message in the New Testament. They're never like a sideshow or just something that happens as kind of a thing that happens when believers get together. But as Jesus would often teach that he was the bread of life, then he would multiply the bread. And it's so true with who Jesus is. He declares this message on Palm Sunday, and on Easter Sunday, he proves it with the miracle of resurrection. Jesus proves who he claims to be and conquers sin and death and the grave in this week known as Passion Week. Now, last question. Why does this matter to us? We know a little bit about the donkey. You know a little bit about the, you know, the palms, what they're shouting. My heart, my hope this morning is that you see there's no denying who Jesus is, who he claimed to be as he's accepting worship as a king, 
C.S. Lewis, you're probably very familiar with this quote when seeking to help people identify who Jesus is, only really gives three options. Jesus, he's a liar if this isn't true. For him to come in and receive worship, he's not a good teacher. Good teachers don't do this. They don't present themselves to be something they're not. Jesus is either a liar or he's just crazy. Like he's a lunatic. Just right. Yeah, they're just okay. Or he's Lord. Those are your options. There, there is no other option. He, he's not just well, like Confucius, like Muhammad. Oh, there's Jesus. No. Jesus very clearly here is receiving worship. And to do so is either to make him evil. This is wrong if this isn't true. Or he's just nuts. Or he really is who he says to be. He's Lord. He's Lord. And I want to take a turn here, if I can, in this message. Because, you know, the gospel accounts give so much focus on what's happening in this week. I want to take a moment and just kind of dive into maybe the heart and mind of emotion of Jesus on this day. You know, in Luke 19, Luke gives us this insight into Jesus as he was navigating this dynamic of Palm Sunday. I'll read it to you starting in verse 41, and we'll have it on the screen. Luke records this for us. As he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. And he says, How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late. And peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in you from on every side. They will crush you to the ground and your children with you. And your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Do you see that last line? When God visited you. He's speaking about this dynamic that one day oppressors would come in and tear down the temple. Not one stone would be left upon another. And for those of you that know your history, your biblical narrative, you know what he's talking about. But here's the point. As he sees these people on Palm Sunday, there's this emotion of somberness, sadness, because they did not recognize that when God was right there in front of them, in Jesus, as 100% man, 100% God, they didn't turn to him. They didn't recognize him. And he wept over the city of Jerusalem. It's like he's saying, I wish you would understand what's happening on this day, Palm Sunday. He says, of all people, you should know. Why? Zechariah 9, 9, he's riding in. It's Passover week. Do you, do you get kind of the whole typology and fulfillment and foreshadowing of what's happening for centuries? They've been celebrating this festival with a sacrificial lamb, reminded and being reminded of how God saved them from Egypt. And here's Jesus on Passover week riding into Jerusalem, that holy city of the people of God. People are quoting from Psalm 118. It's so crystal clear. Jesus is declaring himself to be Messiah which some would say only he can do just by doing the math. You say, what do you mean by doing the math? Many people believe that when Jesus says there in Luke 19, how I wish today that you would all, of all people would understand the way of peace, that he very well could be referring to what they would have been very familiar with, a prophecy from Daniel, a prediction of a, somewhat of a timetable of when the Messiah would arrive. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, in Daniel chapter 9, there's this prophecy given. I'll put it up for you up on the screen. It's this from Gabriel. Now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes, the Messiah. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with the streets of strong defenses despite the perilous times. And after this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. Say, Neil, why do you say this? You, you've been asking these four questions, you know, what's up with the donkey? What's up with the palms? What are they saying and why? Why does it matter to us? Here we see the emotion of Jesus. Well, some would say, 
that according to this prediction, there's no other person in history, in past or in coming, that can fulfill all that the Messiah could and should be based on this prophecy. See, what do you mean? This passage in Daniel 9, Gabriel the angel is speaking to Daniel. And he says, 69 units of seven, or 483 years, would pass from the time the command was given. What command? Nehemiah chapter 2. Perhaps you were with us when we studied through that book, when there was a command given to rebuild the temple. He says there'll be a time period, 483 years, from the time that command happens to when the Messiah is going to come on the scene. So there's a, a sense of clarity to maybe when the Messiah would come. One author, Sir Robert Anderson of Scotland Yard, wrote a book called The Coming Prince. And in that book, he recognizes that that commandment was given in 445 B.C. in the month of March. Using a Babylonian calendar, discovered that 483 years is equal to a certain number of days. And beginning at that point when the commandment was made, it led to a date in A.D. 32 in the month of April. And that would have been the time when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and presented himself as king. David Guzik, he says this about this. He says, taking Anderson, this individual we're just referencing, his calculations as reliable, we see a remarkable fulfillment of prophecy. A Gentile king, Cyrus was the one who made the decree that the temple should be rebuilt. And 483 years later to the day, Jesus presents himself as the Messiah to the prince of Israel. So it's not just that Jesus believed himself to be the Messiah, that he's a lunatic, and that he's preaching a message on Palm Sunday. But mathematically, according to fulfilled prophecy, Jesus is the only person in all of human history that could be the Messiah, according to Daniel chapter 9. So here's the point. Why does Jesus need a donkey? He's fulfilling prophecy. He's riding in a donkey and declaring a message claiming to be king. Why the palms? It's a symbol of freedom, a symbol of a conqueror. What are they shouting? Hosanna, salvation has come. Jesus is receiving it. And why does it matter? Because no one else can be the Messiah. Palm Sunday proves it. So what does all this point to on Palm Sunday? Very simple. He and he alone, Jesus is the unique one, the Messiah, the Son of God, the only one who's qualified to take our sins. And the crowds looked for a Messiah who would rescue them immediately from their current suffering, their political challenges, and free them nationally. But Jesus had come to save them spiritually. Right? We're learning that together as we're going through the Gospel of Mark, where he says the kingdom of God is now. Right now, God can step into your life and you come under his authority and rule and reign and be led by him. First things first. Our greatest need, our primary need, is not political freedom, national salvation, but spiritual forgiveness. And Jesus does come as a conqueror, conquering sin, conquering the hearts and lives of all those who would follow him. He came to usher in a kingdom that is now and is here, the rule and reign of God in your life. And may we together, may we as individuals on this Palm Sunday come under the rule and the reign of this king, this King Jesus, who declared himself to be king on Palm Sunday. See, Jesus mounted that donkey, rode into Jerusalem, declared himself to be king of the Jews. The one who would make it possible for us to have a relationship with God and relationships with others. A love relationship with God and a love relationship with others. And that's the message of Palm Sunday. And this morning, as kind of a reminder gift of this message, we have these palm crosses that we're going to give to you on your way out this morning. These palm crosses were made lovingly by a few women in our church. And the palm, I hope you remember, is a symbol of freedom, of a conqueror. Jesus is the one who conquers sin and death. 
Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes our freedom that was purchased by this conquering, donkey-riding Messiah. Colossians chapter 2, Paul writes this, You were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. The language of that shaming is that he like took the devil and put his face in the dirt. <laughs> That's the imagery that would have been taken in by those who first read this. Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, he conquered sin, death, and the grave. So as you take these crosses this morning, as you kind of begin to remember and to celebrate this whole week, that, that Palm Sunday is the message of who Jesus is. He's the king. Good Friday, that, that's the method by which he's reconciled us to God through the cross. Easter Sunday, there's the miracle that proves it and seals it, that we're forgiven, that what he did on the cross conquers sin, death, and the grave. I pray that you'd be reminded of the goodness and greatness of God by giving his son Jesus this week for us so that we can have victory over sin, over death, and over the grave. The message, the method, and the miracle. What a wonderful week we get to celebrate Jesus, our King, the Messiah.